I'm in many pulpits in the course of a year. And I've been in some very special pulpits. I've preached in John Calvin's pulpit. I've preached in John Knox's pulpit. I've preached in James Montgomery Boyce's pulpit. I've preached in R.C. Sproul's pulpit. I've preached in a lot of special pulpits. There is no pulpit more special to me than this pulpit. Because of the one who has stood here for almost 50 years. I first came to a shepherd's conference in 1982 as a very young man, um, having just begun my first pastorate. The shepherd's conferences were so small, we met in the chapel back then. And how God worked in my life through what I heard has been life-changing. And I'm always mindful of that when I am able to stand in this pulpit. I've carried an influence for 34 years. I believe that the host of our conference is the premier expositor of our generation. And he's been the leading influence in my life in preaching. And on top of that, he has been such a friend to me. Uh, no one has been more encouraging and more loyal and supportive to me outside of my own family than John MacArthur. So I'm very thankful to stand here. And Conrad, I, I have to say your sermon, I, I, I feel something like Isaiah in Isaiah 6, that I, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unseen, unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory. So thank you for that explosion that went off in this pulpit just a short time ago. I've been asked to comment on two things. One is the Doctor of Ministry program. I'm very grateful to oversee the Doctor of Ministry program here at the Master's Seminary. We had a huge turnout today for lunch to talk about the Doctor of Ministry program, one of the largest rooms. We were just jam-packed with men wanting to get to the next level in their preaching. And I just simply want to say to all of you men, if you've ever thought about pursuing a Doctor of Ministry degree, now is the time and this is the place to do it. This is the premier program, I believe, in the world for expository preaching and to take you to the next level in your skill and efficiency to proclaim the Word of God. We would love to talk to you about being a part of this program. The other thing I will leave to Michael afterwards. If you would take your Bible and turn with me to John chapter 10. The passage that has been assigned to me is a wonderful assignment that I embrace. I've been asked to speak on Jesus, the Good Shepherd. And in John chapter 10, I want us to look this afternoon in verses 11 through 18. 
And I want to begin by reading the passage and setting it back before your heart. And I pray that God will enable you to drink in these verses. Jesus is the speaker. And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. What makes these verses so special? is that this is Jesus' own commentary on His own death and resurrection. This is Jesus preaching Christ. This is Jesus preaching Christ and Him crucified. This is Jesus preaching on Jesus. This is the greatest preacher who ever walked this earth, Jesus Christ, the living Word. And he is preaching on the greatest subject that there is in all of the universe, the sin-bearing, substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is here both speaker and subject. He is both teacher and theme. He is both preacher and proposition. These verses are not more inspired than other portions of Scripture that focus upon the cross, but these verses are more personal because this is Jesus bearing His heart and bearing His soul concerning His own death and His own resurrection. And strangely enough, the congregation that day were the false shepherds of Israel. And the timing is immediately after His healing the blind man in the previous chapter, John chapter 9. And there is no… there is no break in the continuity as we move from John chapter 9 now to to John chapter 10. And Jesus now addresses the false shepherds of Israel regarding the nature of the true shepherd, the good shepherd himself. In verses 1 through 10, which we will not have time to develop, uh, Jesus really sets the scene in what is known as what verse 6 refers to as a figure of speech. It is in reality what we would call an allegory. 
And we do not allegorize the Bible when we interpret, yet the Bible does contain this figure of speech that is known as an allegory. An allegory is a, a parable on steroids. With a parable, there is one central truth that is the dominant driving thrust, and you can get in trouble quickly when you begin to push the details of, of a parable. But with an allegory, it is multifaceted, it is far more complex, and there is much more attention to detail in the, di in the individual parts of the allegory. What we have before us is an allegory. Isaiah chapter 5 is an allegory. There, there are multiple allegories that are found in the pages of Scripture. And this is figurative language, as verse 6 says. And, and just to quickly summarize verses 1 through 10, and what you need to know in verse 1 is there is a sheepfold. Now, this sheepfold is apostate Israel with its dead religion. And inside this sheepfold, representing the nation of Israel, there are many different individual flocks. And mixed among the individual flocks of sheep in this large community sheepfold that was within the city where a shepherd would leave his flock during the during the night under the care of the doorkeeper, and he would go and have a night's rest and then come back the next day to call out his own flock. There were many different flocks inside this larger sheepfold, which represented the spiritual deadness of the nation Israel at this time. In verse 1, we also see the thieves and the robbers. And these thieves and robbers are the congregation to whom Jesus is speaking that day. These are the Pharisees. These are the hired hands. These are those who stole glory from God. These are those who made the temple to be a robber's den. They have no care for the sheep. They are fleecers of the flock. They are thieves and, and robbers, and they are not the rightful owners of the sheep. In verse 2, we're introduced to the shepherd who is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Uh, Jesus identifies Himself as this shepherd who is mentioned in verse 2, in verse 11, and in verse 15, He is this good shepherd. He is the one who has been given the care of the true flock of God. And in verse 3, we see the doorkeeper and various interpreters give us different explanations. And in verse 3, we also see the sheep. The sheep are the elect of God. Uh, the sheep are those who have been chosen by God before the foundation of the world. And according to verse 29 later, they are those who have been entrusted to the care of this good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father has chosen and elected them before time began and has given them to the Son, to this shepherd, to be, to be His people, to be His flock to be His sheep. And in verses 3 through 5, we see the shepherd's voice. This is the effectual call of the shepherd to the elect sheep. They are the only ones who will recognize the voice of their shepherd. The other flocks and the other sheep who are in this large community sheepfold, they will hear the audible voice, but they will not recognize that voice as that of their own shepherd. But when the sheep hear the voice of their shepherd, these elect sheep, they are immediately drawn to that voice. And the shepherd will call out to them by name because he is the rightful owner of these sheep. And he calls them by name, and he calls them white nose or black ear or, 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 or brown leg. And when they hear their name being called, they begin to separate from the other sheep who just continue to have their head down and continue to do their grazing. But when the sheep hear the voice of their shepherd, they immediately raise their head 
and they are drawn to that voice, and they begin to separate themselves from the rest of the flocks and from the rest of the sheep, and they go to their shepherd. They hear what the other sheep do not hear. They are given ears to hear. And the good shepherd cannot leave them in this apostate sheepfold. He he must lead them out. He must lead them out of this of this graveyard, out of this barren wilderness. He must lead them out of apostate Israel, and He leads them out according to these verses. And and as they separate and come out, the other shepherds call out to the elect sheep, but a stranger's voice they will not hear. And they will continue to follow the voice of their shepherd, and they are one with their shepherd. And He leads them out of the city and leaves behind this apostate sheepfold and leads them out into the countryside, and there He builds His own sheepfold. And He rolls the rocks to form a wall, and He leaves an opening in the wall. And according to verse 7, He Himself becomes the door of the sheep, and He will call them into this countryside sheepfold, and once they're all in the sheepfold, He will lay down in the opening, and He seals them in, and He seals out any predators or any wild beasts who would try to come into the sheepfold. They have to go through the shepherd in order to get to the sheep. And he is a heroic shepherd. He is a a courageous shepherd. And if it is necessary, he will lay down even his own life to protect his own sheep. And then in the morning, in the day, he will arise from this open doorway, and he will call to his sheep, and he will lead them out into green pastures and beside still waters. And according to verse 10, he gives them life. He gives them abundant life, and He feeds their soul to the fullness until they are overflowing. And this is repeated day after day. He leads them in, leads them in and leads them out, leads them in for protection at night, and leads them out for provision during the day. And what a relationship exists between the shepherd and the sheep. He is responsible for all their needs, and if need be, He will lay down even His life to protect them. In verse 11, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, this is one of seven I am statements that is found in the Gospel of John, which really forms the the spine or the backbone of the Gospel of John. And this particular I am statement in verse 11 finds itself really at the apex position. There are three that will lead up to it. There are three that will lead down from it. And the first three I am statements that are like stair steps that lead up to this fourth I am statement, Jesus has already said, uh, I am the bread of life, John 6, 35, and I am the light of the world, John 8, 12, and I am the door of the sheep, John 10, verse 9. But sitting here in the premier spot is, I am the good shepherd. And then leading down and away from this are the final three I am statements. He will say, I am the resurrection and the life in John 11, 25, and 26, and then I am the way and the truth and the life, John 14, 6, and I am the true vine, John 15, 5. This sits in the very center of these seven I am statements, I believe, because the cross is in the very center of Christianity. There is a reason why over my shoulder there is a cross. There is not a a manger, and there is not even a throne, and there is not an empty tomb. There is a cross, because it is the cross that is the ultimate 
focal point of, of Christianity. And we are to be reminded of this cross again and again and again every time we come to the Lord's table. It, it finds itself at the very epicenter of Christianity. And so it finds itself at the very epicenter of these I am statements, as it will be this discourse wrapped around I am the Good Shepherd will be Jesus' fullest exposition of His substitutionary death upon the cross. This will be Jesus exegeting Himself. This will be Jesus expositing Himself as the Good Shepherd who lays down His life for the sheep. As we look today at verses 11 through 18, there are three things that I want you to note. I want you to note at the beginning of verse 11 the exclusive claim, I am the Good Shepherd. And then second, I want you to note the excellent character, beginning in the middle of verse 11 and extending all the way through verse 16, Jesus will give three reasons why He is the Good Shepherd. And it will be an explanation and a defense of His excellent character. This is why He's the Good Shepherd. This is why He's not just the Shepherd, but He is the Good Shepherd. The middle of verse 11 through 16 will explain that. And then finally, the emphatic choice in verses 17 and 18. And you will find the first person singular pronoun, I, mentioned six times in verses 17 and 18. It is an emphatic choice of the will of the Son to lay down His life for the sheep. So please note how verse 11 begins. I want you to note first the exclusive claim, and here Jesus makes a claim of staggering proportions. He says, I am the good shepherd. Now, there are four things that I want you to know about those few words, I am the good shepherd. And number one, it is a declaration of His deity. As Jesus says, I am, He is taking to Himself the name that God has assigned to Himself at the burning bush in Exodus 3, verse 14, I am who I am. The tetragrammaton, the I am statement. This is the divine name. And Jesus is taking this to Himself in unmistakable terms, and Jesus, by saying, I am, is claiming to be truly God, truly God, fully God, fully God. This is a declaration of His deity. And we believe this if we open up the wider scope of theology because Jesus performed the works that only God can perform. Because Jesus receives the worship that only God can receive. Because Jesus possesses the attributes that only God possesses. That Jesus is called the names that only God is called. And Jesus is equated with God Himself. Here Jesus says, I, I am the sacred name for God, Yahweh, Jehovah, I am the Good Shepherd. And throughout the Old Testament, God identified Himself as the shepherd of His people. Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus now is saying, I am this Good Shepherd the Lord Himself. In Psalm 80 and verse 1, the psalmist, as he prays to God, says, Oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel. God is 
called upon as the shepherd of His people. And in Psalm 100, in verse 3, it's, the psalmist writes that we are to serve the Lord with gladness. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Again and again and again throughout the Old Testament, God is identified as the shepherd of His people. Isaiah 40 and verse 11. Ezekiel 34, verses 11 and 12. God says, as a shepherd cares for his herd in the day, so I will care for my sheep. So first of all, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, this is a declaration of, of His deity. And they would later catch the drift of this in verse 33 when they realized He was making Himself out to be God. And Jesus is God and must be God in order to care for us, the flock of God. But second, not only does this mean a declaration of His deity, it is a statement of His sufficiency. A shepherd assumed the total responsibility to meet all the needs of his sheep. And even so, the imagery is meant to convey that Jesus as shepherd assumes full responsibility for the totality of all of our needs. Now, that is what Psalm 23 verse 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He supplies all of our needs. Now, Jesus will say to His disciples in John 15 verse 5, apart from Me, you can do nothing. But in Philippians 4 verse 13, Paul writes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens Me. To know this shepherd is to know the one who is committed to meeting all of your needs, top to bottom, north, south, east, west, whether directly or indirectly, or whether personally or providentially. He has assumed the care of our lives. Third, it is an evidence of His exclusivity. Now, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, meaning the one and only good shepherd. Not a good shepherd, but the good shepherd. There are no other good shepherds but this shepherd. And He is the only one to shepherd our souls through this life and one day to lead us into the very presence of God in heaven. Peter said, there is salvation in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. This I am statement is an evidence of His exclusivity, and there is no one else and nothing else in this world that can meet your needs except the Lord Jesus Christ. And He may work through other people, and He may work through circumstances and, and what would be the affairs of providence, but nevertheless, it is all under the watch care of the Good Shepherd. And then fourth, it is a guarantee of His goodness. He says, I am the good shepherd. This word good, kalos, means noble, excellent, beautiful, choice, ideal, superior. Uh, Jesus is excellent in His person. Jesus is excellent in His character. Jesus is superior in His being. He is the good shepherd, and He can only do good to us all the days of our life. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You and I will never preach any better than when we preach this Christ, who is the Good Shepherd of His sheep. And the better we would feed our flock, the more we must tell them of this Good Shepherd. And there needs to be less of us and more of Him in our preaching. Now, we do not want them to be dependent upon us. We want them to be dependent upon Him. 
And we are but under shepherds. He is the chief shepherd. He is the great shepherd. He is the good shepherd. And the best and greatest service that we can do to our people as we preach and as we shepherd the flock of God is to do all that we can to hold forth His goodness, His glory, His greatness. This is the exclusive claim. Second, I want you to note the excellent character, because Jesus does more than simply announce that He is the Good Shepherd, He now, the great teacher that He is, gives explanation as to why He is the Good Shepherd. And Jesus will now give three reasons why He is the Good Shepherd. Again, He does not merely tell us that He is the Good Shepherd, He now explains to us why He is the Good Shepherd. And reason number one is found in verse 11 immediately, and Jesus does not save the best for last. He actually front loads this at the very beginning of His explanation. He throws down the greatest reason. He dies for His sheep. Notice what He says, I I am the good shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down His life for the sheep. This is figurative language that pictures and represents His death upon the cross on behalf of His sheep, that He lays down His life when His sheep are in great danger, when His sheep are exposed as His sheep are are defenseless and and helpless, it is this Good Shepherd who, who comes to their aid and will deliver them from danger and rescue them from ruin because He will lay down His life for the sheep. I want you to notice how He stresses how voluntary this, this laying down of His life for the sheep is. He says, The Good Shepherd lays down His life for the sheep. Please note, His life was not taken. His life was given. And He will stress this five times in this passage. Here in verse 11, and then in verse 15, He will say, I lay down my life for the sheep. Then in verse 17, I lay down my life. And then in verse 18, twice, He will say that I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. Five times. This is the the, the stress that he makes. His blood was not spilt. It was poured out. The cross was not a human accident. It was a divine appointment. He did not say, I am finished, but it is finished, as He chose volitionally of His own will to give His life for the sheep. This also emphasizes the vicarious nature of His death. As He says in verse 11, the Good Shepherd lays down His life And the idea is unto death, lays down his life unto death for the sheep. That little preposition for, who pair, large doors swing on small hinges. And major theology hinges on three little English words, five in the Greek. This This preposition for means for the benefit of, for the sake of, instead of, in the place of. And this speaks of the vicarious, substitutionary death of Jesus Christ in the place of and for the benefit of the sheep. In Matthew 20, 28, Jesus says, I give, He has come to give His life a ransom for many. 
And in Galatians 1, 4, the Lord Jesus Christ gave Himself for our sins. Ephesians 5, verse 2, Christ gave Himself up for us. But there's more in verse 11. It was seen how voluntary it was and how vicarious it was. But I want you to note how specific it was, how definite it was, how particular it was. He says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Who are the sheep? Or the sheep are those who recognize His voice. The sheep are those who are drawn to that voice. The sheep are those who are led out of apostate Israel. The sheep are those who follow the shepherd. The sheep are those, according to verse 29, who have been given by the Father to this good shepherd. The sheep are very clearly the elect. Jesus laid down His life for His sheep, not for other sheep, and certainly not for the goats, but He laid down His life for the sheep, His sheep. And verse 26 will tell us that not everyone is one of His sheep, all for whom Jesus will lay down His life, will be saved. And none for whom He died will ever perish. This text, as Jesus is the expositor of His own death, very clearly teaches what theologians today call the definite atonement of Jesus Christ. It is not an indefinite atonement for an anonymous group of people, but it is a very definite atonement for those for whom He has assumed the care for their soul, and those whom He knows by name, and those whom He will call to Himself by name. It is exclusively for the sheep that Jesus lays down His life. Now, this text gives us much insight into this. Now, first of all, this is what the text plainly says, I laid down my life for the sheep. Now, this text is abundantly clear. He repeats it in verse 15, that he lays down his life for the sheep. But second, the intent of Jesus' is coming defines the extent of his death. You tell me why He came, and I will tell you for whom He died. And very clearly at the beginning of this allegory, He has come not for the entire sheepfold. He has not come for all of the other sheep. He has only come for His sheep, and it is for His sheep that He calls them by name. It is to His sheep that He leads them out. It is His sheep, according to verse 9, that they are saved. It is His sheep for whom He has laid down His life, because that was His intent in coming into this world, was to secure the salvation of His sheep. Third, there is the unity within the Trinity that defines the extent of the atonement. In verse 29, which is another discourse, but here very closely related in context, in verse 29, Jesus said, My Father, who has given them to me, the them refers to the sheep in verse 27, who hear His voice, who follow Him, those to whom He gives eternal life in verse 28, and those who will never perish in verse 29, and will never be snatched out of His hand 
It is the Father in verse 29 who has given them to Him. And then in verse 30, He makes this extraordinary statement. He says, I and the Father are one. And that does not mean one person. That would be heretical. It means they are one in mission, one in purpose, one in intent, one in saving enterprise. Those whom the Father has chosen, the Father has given to the Son, and the Son has received them as the Father's love gift, and the, Father, the Son has come into this world to be their good shepherd, and He lays down His life for the very same group that the Father chose and entrusted to His care. I was in London a few years ago and was spending a couple of nights at London Theological Seminary in their dormitory, and it just happened to be the week of the John Owen lectures. I came down from my room and sat in the dining room with the students who were gathered from all parts, and I asked them what the focus of the conference was, and they said, well, this is the John Owen conference, and what in particular are you focusing upon? And they said, well, John Owen, volume 10 the death of death and the death of Christ. And the professor who was teaching that week was the leading John Owen scholar in the world. I can't remember his name. And I said, I want you to right now throw down the ace of spades on this breakfast table and give me what he says is the number one reason to believe in definite atonement. Don't give me number two, number three, or number four. Give me the most compelling reason for particular redemption. And he said, well, that's very easy. According to John Owen and according to this Owen scholar, it is the unity of the Trinity that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit operate as one Savior. That is why we baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, because they all three work together as one Savior. The Father is a Savior, the Son is a Savior, and the Spirit is a Savior, and they all work as one Savior with one purpose, on one mission, according to one eternal purpose. And the only way that the unity within the Godhead is preserved is what we read here in verse 30, I and the Father are one, in this context of the saving purposes of God the Father through the Son and laying down His life for the sheep. Otherwise, what you have is you have the Father choosing to save one group that ends up being only those who will eventually believe because of an obscured understanding of foresight, but you have the Son saving for a totally different group that He would die for the entire world. The Father is only saving believers, the Son is saving the entire world, and then the Spirit is saving a group that is halfway in between as He is trying to woo people to Christ. This is like a man getting on a horse and riding out in every direction at once. It cannot be done. And so Jesus is saying, I lay down my life for the sheep because it is the Father who chose these sheep and has given these sheep to me. And as verse 15 says, or verse 14 says, they are my own. And verse 26 says, the Pharisees are not of His sheep but He only lays down His life for the sheep. This is a very important point. In John 15, 13, He will say that He lays down His life for His friends. In Acts 20, verse 28, it, he, 
Paul will say that Christ purchased the church with His own blood, the blood of God. And in Romans 8, 32, it says that He has died for the elect. And in Ephesians 5, 25, it says that He gave Himself for His bride. And in Hebrews 2, verse 12, it says that He tasted death for His brethren who are the given ones who have been entrusted to Him by the Father. This is why He is such a good shepherd. Because all for whom He has been entrusted their care, and all those for whom He will lay down His life, it is these and these only that He will save. He is a good shepherd. At the cross, Jesus did not purchase the entire world, and then only receive back from the Father those who believe. At the cross, there was equity. At the cross, Jesus received all that He paid for. And Jesus received the elect in salvation because Jesus paid for their salvation alone. In this transaction between the Father and the Son at the cross, Jesus was not shortchanged. Jesus was not gypped at Calvary. Jesus was not cheated on the cross. Jesus was not stiffed at Golgotha. All that He bought, He has received to be His own possession. And everyone whom He bought at the cross are now His eternal possession throughout all the ages to come. This is reason number one why He's a good shepherd. You say, well, what about the world? Well, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) What you simply need to know is that cosmos in the gospel of John is used ten different ways. And only one of those ten ways means everybody. So you would be a foolish exegete to go into any text in the Gospel of John and automatically assume that the use of world means every person when that is only one of ten ways that the word world is used in the Gospel of John. And in fact, in John 17 verse 9, he says, I do not pray for the world but for those whom you have given me. And His intercession in prayer, and His intercession on the cross, and His intercession at the right hand of God the Father are an equal intercession. Those for whom He intercedes in prayer are those for whom He interceded upon the cross, are those for whom He intercedes at the right hand of God the Father. Notice verse 12 in total contrast to the Good Shepherd. This is black and white. This is antithetical. This is in juxtaposition. This is in polar opposite. Verse 12, he who is a hired hand, and Jesus is looking at the hired hands as He is preaching this sermon. They are the false shepherds of Israel. They are the hirelings. They are the the Pharisees. He was a hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming, the great danger coming, and leaves the sheep and flees. They they abandon in tough times. They they have no skin in the game. And the wolf snatches them and, and scatters them. Verse 13, he flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. Uh, th- these Pharisees are not the true owners of the sheep. The Father never entrusted them to, to them. The Father entrusted them to the Good Shepherd in eternity past, before time began, before the foundation of the world, and He came into this world in order that He may lay down His life for these sheep. And this is the very reason why the, 
the Pharisees do not recognize the voice of Jesus because they're not one of His sheep. And that is why what He is teaching them is water on a duck's back. It, it is noise to dead men's ears. They cannot hear what Jesus is saying because they are not one of His sheep. And as the wolf comes, and as it anticipates the cross of the Lord Jesus, Jesus steps forward and places Himself between the wolf and the sheep and says to the wolf, you cannot have my sheep. And He lays down His life that He might rescue them. How can we ever come to the Lord's table the same again? Are not our hearts melted down by this good shepherd that our names were written upon his heart as he was hanging upon the cross? Are not our eyes teared, filled with tears? Do not our voices quiver when we stand at the Lord's table and, and, and give instruction to the, to the flock of God? Do not our jaws drop and our knees bend before this God every time we come to the Lord's table as we remember His death. But I want you to note, second, why He's the Good Shepherd. One, He dies for the sheep. Two, He loves the sheep. Notice verse 14. I am the good shepherd. He repeats it again. It's an, uh, a, a reaffirmation for emphasis. I am the good shepherd to, to distinguish himself from the false shepherds who are standing there that day. No, no, no. I am the good shepherd. And I know my own. When he says, I know my own, it is a Greek word, as you well know, that means not that he has just simply intellectual, cognitive knowledge of their existence as if to say, I know about my own. Now, this Greek word, gnosko, means that he has the most intimate, tender, loving relationship with his sheep. This word is used in other places for the physical intimacy between a husband and wife that is reserved exclusively for a husband and wife. Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and gave birth. It speaks of how experientially and eternally Jesus loves us, His sheep, and please note the reciprocal, and my sheep know me. The order is very important. First He knows us, then we know Him. He first knew us in eternity past. That's what the word foreknowledge means. I love what George Whitfield says when he's preaching on the conversion of, of Zacchaeus from Luke 19 and, and how Jesus saw Zacchaeus up in the sycamore tree and Whitfield pauses and said, well, of course he saw Zacchaeus in the sycamore tree. He's known him for all eternity past. <laughs> How could he miss him within time? The word foreknowledge has absolutely nothing to do with foresight. That, that is a pagan myth. That is a religious superstition that has no basis in, in any exegetical reality whatsoever. It is just a figment of someone's vain imagination. God has never looked into the future and ever learned anything. Amen. Foreknowledge means those whom God previously set His heart upon with distinguishing love, distinguishing covenant, intimate, personal, sovereign love. And the fact that we love Him 
is simply because He first loved us. And how close is this intimate relationship that the shepherd has with the sheep and the sheep have with the shepherd? Well, verse 15 gives the measure. To what extent does the shepherd know the sheep? Verse 15, even as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Now, just pause for that at that point for a moment. Think about John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, pros, face to face with God. And John 1, verse 18, Jesus was in the bosom of the Father. Face to face, in the bosom, the, the intimacy between the Father and the Son, and the Son and the Father. That is what Jesus is referring to here, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and, in the word and, it's, this now leads, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus knows us as the Father knows Him. And Jesus supremely demonstrates this love for us by laying down His life for helpless, wayward, defenseless, vulnerable sheep. There's a third reason why He's the Good Shepherd. Number one, He dies for the sheep. Number two, He loves the sheep. Number three, in verse 16, he, he unites his sheep. He says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Now remember, this started with apostate Israel, and he calls out his elect sheep out of the spiritual deadness of, of, of Israel, but he now says, I, I have other sheep from another fold. And these, these other sheep from another fold refer to Gentile sheep outside the fold of Israel. And notice it's in the present tense, I have other sheep. They have not yet come to Him, but He already possesses them because the Father has chosen them and entrusted them to Him, and He has received them, and they are His own. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Now, watch this. I must. If you have your pen, just underline, I must. I must bring them. This must is the must of divine necessity. It is the must of divine certainty. It is the must of divine sovereignty. It is the must of the effectual call. It is the must of the sovereign drawing and sovereign regeneration of the Son by the Spirit. He says, I must bring them. And the idea very clearly is they will not come on their own. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. Sheep must be brought. And he says, I, I must bring them. Now, notice this and, meaning inseparably connected with what he just said, and they will hear my voice. I must, they will. I must, they will. I must, they will. They will be given ears to hear his voice. And he says, I must bring them, and they will come. And he repeats it, and he says, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Oh, the divine certainty of all the sheep for whom Christ dies, the sheep who have been entrusted to His care, that they will, they will all come. John 6, verse 37, all that the Father has given me shall come to me. And notice it says, they will become one flock. Do you see that? There will not be a Baptist flock. There will not be a Presbyterian flock. 
There will not be an independent flock. There will not be a Messianic Jew flock. There will not be a Reformed flock. There will not be an Arminian flock. There will not be a Charismatic flock. There will be one flock, one flock, with one shepherd. When Whitfield used to preach, he used to, in the middle of a sermon, look up into heaven and say, Lord, are there any Baptists in heaven? And Whitfield will say the answer would come down from the throne of God. No, no Baptists in heaven. Lord, are there any Presbyterians in heaven? Not a single Presbyterian in heaven. Are there any Congregationalists? Are there any Methodists? Are there any Independents? And the answer each time, Whitfield would say, would roll down from the throne of grace. No, there are none like that known here in heaven. Then who is in heaven? And the answer is only those sheep who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Jesus could not be any more clear about this. And as I hear some Christians talk about it, when we get to heaven, we're all going to be in different rooms. And I wouldn't mind some of them being in their own room. It's called the outhouse. <laughs> no, we're all in our Father's mansion. It's just one big room. It's one flock, one shepherd, one body, one head. And I love this. Jesus said, I must, they shall. And the reason you have come to faith in Jesus Christ is not because you're smarter than others in your family, and not because you're more spiritual than the people who live around you. It's because Jesus said, I must and you will. Amen. Listen to Charles Haddon Spurgeon. We can't have a sermon without Spurgeon. <laughs> Spurgeon said, oh, I love God's shalls and God wills. There is nothing like them. Let a man say, I shall, and what is it good for? That man says, I will, and he never performs. I shall, he says, and he breaks his promise. But it is never so with God. If God says, I shall, it shall be. If God says, I will, it will be. Now, he has said, many, will, many shall come. The devil says, they shall not come. God says, they shall come. You yourselves may be saying, oh, I won't come to Christ. God says, you shall come. Yes, there are some here who are laughing at salvation, who scoff at Christ and, and mock at the gospel, but I tell you that some of you will yet come. You say, can God make me come and make me become a Christian? I tell you, yes, for herein is the power of the gospel. It does not ask for your consent. It gives it. God does not, it does not say, will you have it? It makes you willing in the day of His power. The gospel wants not your consent. It gives it. It knocks the enmity out of your heart. You say, I will not be saved. Christ says, you shall be saved. He makes your will turn around, and then you cry, Lord, save me or I perish. Ah, oh, might heaven exclaim, I knew I would make you say that. And then God rejoices over you because He has changed your will and made you willing in the day of His power. Spurgeon said, if Jesus Christ were to stand on this platform tonight, what would many do with Him? If He were to come and say, here I am, I love you, will you be saved by me? Not one of you would consent if left to your own will. But He Himself said, no man can come to me except the Father who sent me draw him. Ah, oh, we want that, and here we have it. They shall come, they shall come, they shall come. He goes on to say, Christ will not die in vain. Christ will see His seed and be satisfied, and He will not shed His blood in vain, for He will have a bride, and He will have all for whom He laid down His life. 
My friend, that is a gospel I can preach. That is a gospel that makes us bold in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because as we preach, God is at work in hearts. And those who put up the greatest resistance can be brought down in a moment when they are made to hear the voice of their shepherd. Now, finally, I want you to note the emphatic choice, and we're finished. We've seen the exclusive claim, I am the good shepherd. We have seen the excellent character. He, he, lay, he dies for his sheep. He loves his sheep. He unites his sheep. Finally, the emphatic choice. Jesus now concludes this survey of the cross, far better than what Isaac Watts could have ever written. And Jesus now stresses how intentional will be His death for His sheep. In verse 17, Jesus said, for this reason, the Father loves me. And why does the Father love the Son? Because the Father loves obedience, and because the Son is obedient to the Father. And the Father loves the obedience of the Son to His eternal will. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in perfect obedience to the will of the Father. This is why the Father loves me. I'm not off doing my own thing. I'm in perfect unity and in perfect harmony and in perfect conformity with the eternal decree and the eternal purpose of the Father from before the foundation of the world. The Son has not come down here on a vague mission to just roam around and go His own way. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. This is figurative language referring to the resurrection. His death will not be the end. His, his death will simply be followed by His resurrection. In verse 18, no one. It's a strong negative denial. No one. No Roman ruler, no Jewish leaders, no angry mob, no un, unruly circumstances, no demon spirits, no devil, no one has taken it from me. The it refers to his life. They would all just be secondary causes under the instrument, under the initial instrumentality and authorship of God the Father. No one has taken it from me but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. Exousia, out of one's own being, out of one's own self. He has the right to exercise power over his own being, even in his incarnation and in his humiliation. He retained the authority to exercise the right to lay down his life at the time and at the place and by the manner of the Father's choosing. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Jesus raised himself from the dead, and it has already been mentioned in this conference that it, he was he was raised, and yes, the Father did raise Him, and the Spirit did raise Him, Romans 1, 4. But it was a Trinitarian resurrection, and Jesus also raised Himself from the dead. And He came walking out of that tomb, a risen, living, victorious Savior. And He concludes this by saying, this commandment, referring to the entirety of His of His saving mission, to leave heaven, to enter the human race, to be born of a virgin, to be born under the law, to live an obedient and perfect life, to give His life for the sheep, to raise Himself from the dead, the entirety of the mission, He says, this commandment I received from my Father. I am a man under authority. That is why I have authority to lay my life down. 
Jesus came here under strict orders. A commandment that He had received from His Father before the world began. As the Father, according to His own eternal counsel and wisdom, set His heart upon His chosen ones, and He gave them to the Son, and then commanded the Son to enter into this world and to live a sinless and perfect life and to secure the perfect righteousness that is imputed to us in the act of justification and to go to Calvary's cross and there as an act of His will to lay down His life for the sheep. This is the Christ we must preach. This is the Christ we must imitate and emulate in our shepherding. We must give ourselves to our flocks. We must lay down our life for their good. We must call them by name. We must know them. We must allow ourselves to be known by them. We must have a personal and close as possible relationship with those who we lead as their under-shepherd, and we must do all that we can to unite the sheep and our, our flock, and to be peacemakers and to remove any enmity that would have the sheep at odds with each other. And as I close, as you would find yourself here tonight, are you a true shepherd of the flock? Because there are false shepherds. Do you know the Good Shepherd? It is one thing to preach on the door of the sheep. It is one thing to do word studies on the door of the sheep. It is one thing to admire the door of the sheep. It is one thing to point others to the door of the sheep. It is one thing to have your toes right up to the door of the sheep. But have you ever taken that decisive step of faith and come all the way to saving faith in Jesus Christ yourself? Hey, could it be possible that as you find yourself here today, that you in reality are like these Pharisees, and if so, you are a thief and you are a robber and you are stealing glory from God? You must respond to the voice of the shepherd, and you must come to Him by faith and entrust your life to Him. And if you've never believed upon Jesus Christ, it is possible to even be at the shepherd's conference and to be an unconverted shepherd. And so, if you've never come by faith to the Good Shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, I call you today on His behalf that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He says to you, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who find it. The gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And few are those who find it. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who hears these words of mine and acts upon them is like a, a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the rains came and the winds blew and beat against the house, it did not fall because it was built upon the rock. He who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them is like a very foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And when the rains came and the winds blew and beat against the house, great was its fall. Have you built upon the solid rock of the divine revelation of Jesus Christ? Or have you built upon simply sand? If you've never built upon the rock, which is Christ, I call you, as we come close to the end of this conference, to believe upon Christ and to take that step of faith and to come through the door of the sheep.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, how we praise you for the Good Shepherd. How we praise you for his excellent character. How he has laid down his life for us. Father, make us faithful shepherds, faithful under shepherds to serve the great shepherd. In Jesus' name, amen.